This country's had the war on cancer for a better part of 40 years. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars raised for the, the cancer fundraisers uh, every year. Uh, but yet it's still such a big problem. Why is that? Uh, they're on the wrong direction. They're in the wrong direction. Yeah, Nixon declared the war on cancer, I think it was 1971. Mm -hmm. The current NCI National Cancer Institute budget is $6 billion a year. The NIH budget is 30, up to, depends on which pay, newspaper you read, up to $36 billion a year. And a lot of the NIH, NIH budget, goes, budget goes to cancer. The American Cancer Society raises six, seven hundred million a year. They have a, a bank account in excess of a billion dollars. And they're, they're one of, to me, they're absolutely a reprehensible organization. One of, less than 29 percent of their in income goes into the charitable purpose. And even then, people have looked in and they said very little goes to actual research. A lot of it goes into very nice salaries for the executives. Um, so uh, unfortunately, uh, we believe that the, the research direction is totally misguided. Uh, chemotherapy began in 1946 when the Department of Defense funded Dr. Goodman and Gilman at uh, Yale University, very eminent pharmacologists who wrote the classic textbook on pharmacology to find a, a medical use for mustard gas. So they did some laboratory experiments and they just found, I mean, they, they were told to do it, they did it, they were funded. And in rats they could reverse tumors using mustard gas, which is, of course, used in the raw, war as a, as a poison. And then they tried it on a single lymphoma patient who had advanced disease and all those tumors regressed. And he did die a couple, you know, within a couple months, but they, no one had ever seen tumors in a cancer patient regress with a drug. And that started the whole chemo regimen. And it was like Madame Curie with radiation. They made the assumption that because it had worked so well in lymphoma, it was going to work for all cancers. Well, and as it turns out, ironically, lymphomas like Hodgkin's are the, one of the few groups of cancers that actually respond to chemo. Most, uh, and they're rare cancers. The majority of cancers, the typical solid tumors, do not respond to chemo. But that, because of that extraordinary response in a single patient that lasted a few weeks, the entire chemo industry came into fruition. Drug companies loved it because you could patent these things. In a natural mm -hmm. treatment, you can't patent. There's absolutely no incentive for any drug company to look into my work, and we've had industry support, but it's, what we do is non-patentable. And great, I think it's great it's non-patentable, and anyone who wants to research it can. But chemo drugs, because they're synthetic creations in the laboratory, can be patented, and that's what started the whole rush, and the whole direction of oncology went because of that single patient in 1946 toward chemotherapy. Even though, you know, 60, you know, 50, 60 years later, you know, what, 66 years later, for most cancers it's not effective, but they're still trying. And now they have the targeted drugs, but they don't work well either, and they're terribly expensive. So it's, cancer just took, there was a, a fork in the road. It could have gone toward natural treatments. It could have gone toward, um, you know, synthetic, and they chose to go with the synthetic drugs based on one patient. Now, interestingly mm -hmm. enough, right about that time, around 1946, Dr. Gerson, who had his own nutritional protocol, what, long before Kelly, had presented cases to Congress of cured cancer patients with a nutritional therapy. And there are actually hearings on Gerson's work, and I have the reports from those. But when the, the single patient responded, they forgot about Gerson and, and the nutritional and alternative. It all went toward chemotherapy. And, and since then, the NCI, the NIH, and the American Cancer Society, they're looking for the magic drug. It was kind of the penicillin model. You know, they were coming off of World War II, where penicillin had saved so many soldiers' lives. You know, penicillin had been discovered by Fleming in uh, 1928, but it wasn't until World War II when you had all these infected wounds in soldiers where it began to be used. It was miraculous, and I give it credit. Of course, it reversed these terrible infections. They had never seen anything like it. So the research establishment was trying to look for that magic bullet like penicillin that would work in cancer the way penicillin worked in infectious disease. Mm -hmm. But infectious disease is completely different than cancer. Mm -hmm. So for a number of theoretical, philosophic, emotional reasons in that single case in 1946, the entire research establishment with hundreds of billions of dollars spent over the last 40 years has gone to chemotherapy.